Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. I had an old friend, we'll call her Dina. She's at my dad's apartment and every other weekend I would go down to stay and Dina and I would end up spending time climbing trees and swimming. We had an old tree house on the edge of the woods behind the apartments. We were told not to go past that tree because the property wasn't ours. But young adventurous children being who they are, we decided to explore. We walked deep into the woods and came across a tiny pond. We would go there every day and play in the pond, which was very unsanitary, realizing that now that I'm older. And one day, we decided to go further into the woods. We walked down for what felt like miles until we came across a giant sinkhole that had tons of wood and furniture collected in it. We stared at this, intrigued and poking around at some of the stuff we could reach. Dina was messing with something in the sinkhole, and when I looked up, I saw a man walking towards us. He was probably mid-thirties, gray sweatpants, gray shirt, and a hat, and he was walking towards us, intensely staring like he could kill us with a look. I shouted for Dina to run, and we took off through the woods. The guy started running behind us. We were lost and didn't know which direction to run in, but I knew that if we followed the old railroad tracks to the right of us, we could make it back to the apartments. Eventually, we lost him, and we came up on the apartments. We ran to my apartment and just as we were coming up to the door, a blue van drove by and the person driving it was that man. And at that time, I didn't realize what was going on. I figured maybe he owned the land and that he was just angry that we were on it. However, I told someone who lived at the apartments this story and they said that the person who owned the land was a woman and she lived nearly four states away. I get goosebumps thinking maybe this guy saw two girls in the woods alone and was thinking of kidnapping us. His windows were all super tinted, which added to my assumption of his intentions. I get so weirded out thinking we could have been kidnapped right behind our home. So, creepy guy who ran after me and my friend in the woods, let's not meet again. Alright, I spent my entire slow day at work yesterday reading through this up, so now I want to share my little story. My childhood best friend, Marie and I, were around 11 or 12 years old at that time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown. I would spend the entire summer each year living in their camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week, and we were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night that I was there, we decided that we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest with more tall thick brush. So we were walking along, not seeing a single other person on the path in front or behind us. But then we hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Marie glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops, and I don't know why I didn't ignore her 
and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice, and I chose to listen. They both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off and we picked up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint. Knowing that the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we are in the parking lot. Suddenly, Marie steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake and the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop, and I go along with it silently understanding that ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Marie is clearly panicking at this point, and we are both looking around, but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Marie walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak, and we climbed in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a long black coat with a hood up despite it being the middle of July and had a terrible smirk on his face. And she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away in his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reached the center of the lake and stopped paddling. I pulled up my Nokia brick phone that my parents had and thank God given me just in case. I handed to Marie and tell her to call her parents to come pick us up and as the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore and then go pale, lifting a hand to point to what she's seeing. I turn and there was the man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake staring at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us, before finally disappearing. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family, and we were freaking out so bad the whole time, as the sun got lower and lower. We did manage to have someone come with a truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go up to the ice cream shop inform an adult there and ask her parents to come get us then. But it worked out and we got back safe and we thankfully never saw the man again. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois on a short dead-end street 10 plus miles away from a town and there were seven houses in the area, spread out on a 2.5-acre wooded lot or larger each. There were no large wild animals, there aren't bears or similarly large animals in the region, and people didn't meander there or show up lost. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years that I lived there, so please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was, and he would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside my window to chat. My bed was right next to the window, and I'd open the window and we would whisper and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway and I'd often know if he was out. The light was on over the side door entrance and I'd often know if he was out or already home. 
One time during the summer, when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of a car and was talking to his friends. Soon, his friends pulled away and I softly called out, as loud as I could without waking my parents. I was asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond though, as he probably didn't hear me. Then, I came up with a not-so-brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent many years in the woods and learning how to blend in and just be silent. As kids, we'd often sneak out and scare each other. So, I silently sneaked down from the second floor and out my back garage door, which led to our backyard below my window, which led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area, then through a well-worn path through the woods, maybe about 20 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house, probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14-inch oak rounds set out as an even stepping path in the gravel, and if you step off the rounds, the crunch of the gravel rocks would give you away. So I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling that he went in, likely to go to bed. I waited a bit as I thought I saw something move in the woods, between our houses, but not on the path that we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So, I thought that it was odd that he'd be out in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark moving through the woods. It was slow and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer, and I definitely saw it. But it was strange, and that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence, wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought it was Terry, and he saw me sneak out and he was trying to scare me. I watched the dark outline of a human figure moving, but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening, checking every few feet while hiding. So, I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching so I quietly tippy-toed back to my garage door and went back inside silently locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing or crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone or something walking around in the yard. I whispered again for Terry out my window, but still got no answer. Then, I heard someone or something fall and grunt or moan pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough that I didn't mistake it and it sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semicircle hole connected to the house dug out about three or four feet deep and then reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level and the hole lets some natural light in. There is no way the Terry would have fallen in our window bell. We had been playing hide and seek and many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints like the back of our hands. The grunt sounded humanish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. And that's when I realized this wasn't a fun game and that someone or something was out there 
and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could, but there was a screen on my window to keep the bugs out, so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks, as whatever it was, was stepping in the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good as being quiet as I was. Whatever it was stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably a half hour. I never heard it, him or her leave, but I grew tired and I eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. There are a few things that I'm certain of. Number one, it wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said that he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie. Number two, I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors and I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We had a few neighbors, and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, these seven houses were spread out in 2.5 plus acres per home. And lastly, there weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer, but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes. Plus, our dog scared them away. So, stranger in the woods, let's not ever meet. In high school, my friend and I frequented trails to go for smallpox. We were both 17 and male, and we'll call him Jay for the story. On this fall afternoon, we went to a familiar trail in a moderately wooded area, and one blunt into our walk, an odd man comes on our path. He startled us. He was middle-aged and plainly dressed, but I think he had some condition. He looked like a stocky Ethan Hawk with crazy eyes, and he spoke to us like a child. The childish man was rambling about hide-and-go-seek, frantically asking, have you seen two kids? Jay and I were both puzzled. We took obvious note of the creepy man in the woods asking about kids, but we didn't know what to do or say. So we ignored him and just continued on the trail to spark another. On our way back to the trail axis, we see the childish man on the path again, yet now with a tall, slim man. Jay urged me to get us out of there. Jay was already non-confrontational, and we both felt an eerie tension. Yet the whole thing was fishy, and I didn't want to regret doing nothing if some kids were at risk. I asked, Why the hell is your friend asking about some kids? They both give the same weird hide-and-go-seek with two kids. The tall man claimed to be the father, and he was more with it than his childish companion, and he kept questioning my concern for his kids. The tall man was getting angry, veering on threatening, and I had a bad gut feeling, but decided to leave this whole weird encounter behind. Yet, on our way out of the woods, we see a boy and a girl stand up from a wheat field. They just rose up like a poem. I observed to see if they needed help, yet they were cheerfully waving at us. I held the thumbs up and they signaled back. I got in the car with Che and we got the hell out of there. Was it just a good father and uncle playing innocent games with their two kids? Was I being nosy and blowing things out of proportion? To this day, I bear an uneasy guilt or anxiety for those kids. I never thought to write about this story. Jay and I still reminisce on it. And I'll never forget the moment we first came up on that childish man. 
I just want to clarify that this was almost definitely a harmless case. However, at that time, it was so fishy that I was positive that we were being filmed in a special Woodland episode of What Would You Do? That said, I was also aware at the time that the first man more than likely had a disability of some kind. His appearance at first was truly startling, and the comportment of the tall man definitely raised my suspicions. I wanted to share a personal experience that happened to a whole bunch of campers up at Mariposa County, California from years ago. It was a deaf camp when this happened in the summer near the end of July. Something very weird happened here and I wanted to share this story since it was an old buried memory that I tucked away. Anyways, this is during the summer when it's really hot. The campers all have activities and fun things to do throughout the day. And being up in the woods or mountain terrain, it got dark relatively quickly around 6 p.m. The boys and girls have cabins separated by gender. So as the boys, we have a more rugged cabin style, which is a wooded lodge lifted up and surrounded by Mosquito Mesh 360 around the whole cabin to the one doorway in and out. There's a bunch of these cabins scattered throughout the woods, and some close to each other, and some not so much. Anyways, one night, I noticed the cabin not being used off in the distance was dancing with lights, white and blue, from the inside. I was yelling out about it, but it was a deaf camp, so I have to wave everyone's attention to it, and our cabin staff were wondering what we were all seeing. Pretty soon, our whole cabin was getting way too excited, so some of them went to the other cabins to explain what was going on, and they went out to meet some other staff to go see what was happening at the isolated unused cabin. It was about 6 to 10 campers per cabin, with about three staff in each cabin, and there was about six cabins active out of the nine male total side cabins. With about almost 20 staff members, the girl side staff had seen what was going on and joined under the lamppost that we have there outside. Basically, we all just watched as campers from the meshy open air cabin windows that wrapped around the structure these lights were just swirling around inside, almost in a playful manner. We were watching the whole time, until it suddenly stopped, and the staff were talking about it and watching from between the cabins the whole time as well, and everybody stopped. Soon, they started walking off towards the cabin in pairs of two, and we never saw the lights again but we were watching them go to the cabin with their flashlights. Soon, they started walking into the woods and spread out like it was a search and rescue style operation with their flashlights scanning the woods ahead of each of the pairs. A few pairs started moving around erratically until everyone looking around ran back to the lamppost and explained what happened and the staff went back to their cabin to wait for the morning. One of my staff said he saw something twice the size of him, and he's like six foot tall. It had the color of white or gray, and it ran by him so fast that he said it was inhuman. He couldn't make out any features or see any face, and he couldn't tell what kind of body it was. He thought it was like a huge blob or something, and everyone was freaking out by now. This was happening at around 10.30 to 11 at night. Nobody really went to sleep that night until morning came, and the people in charge of the camp, or of the deaf camp program, were telling us in the morning that we can no longer go outside our cabins after dinner. They didn't want anyone to get hurt or anything bad to happen. People suspected someone was trespassing, 
But those of us that saw the lights knew that it wasn't light from a flashlight since they were literally dancing around like an air show going on. Nothing ever happened again after that night, but it was very strange and the explanation of whatever some of the staff saw sounded like the fresh snow night crawler to me. This one is a bit of an urban legend in my town that I think you might get a kick out of. It's a good one to tell around the campfire. It's said in Okinawa. It's about my friend, let's call him Kay. He was a pretty crazy kid when he was younger, but I met him when I was about 18. I had just gotten my driver's license and he was always trying to convince our gang of friends to go on road trips. He always wanted to go in search of ghosts or to any haunted locations he could. For example, he was known to go into the abandoned air raid shelters alone in the dead of night. I thought it was just a rumor that there were still skeletons in the air raid shelters, but there was truth to the claims. This didn't deter him. I remember that some of the kids at school said that if you took a photo in a certain air raid shelter at around 2 a.m., then you would see a spirit in the photo. Others said if you went swimming at 2 a.m. around the island and had someone take a photo of you, you would see the arms and grasping fingers of those who had met their end in the watery depths reaching for you. If you aren't convinced, you need only remember or research the history surrounding Okinawa in the war. Of course, no one ever had any evidence of these photos to back up the claims, but it was spooky and mildly interesting nonetheless. Kay wasn't scared of anything, and we all admired his guts and spirit. One night, we were all piled into my car just like usual, only we brought along an acquaintance. He was... Huh, how can I say? A bit of trouble. That night we were heading to an off-limits wharf he knew about. Seriously, I don't know how I let myself get talked into these situations. We had a kind of mini convoy situation. Two cars were following mine. The plan was to be close to the water, let off some fireworks, and those who could drink would, while at least three of us were left with soft drinks. I had my doubts, but to be honest, it was fun. It was one of those summer nights that you felt you'd never forget. That thought couldn't have been truer, considering the aftermath. Since it was dark by the wharf, we aimed our cars toward the water's edge to make sure that we had enough light. When I say wharf, I don't mean some port filled with boats. This seemed to be someone's private mini port, and the best thing about it was that there was no boats, and it was really nice. The headlights were working well, everyone was in good spirits, until someone started shouting about someone in the water. We all turned to look, and to my surprise, there were about five or six people in the water. One looked like it could be a child. Some of the guys said that they couldn't see what we were talking about, but to me, it was plain to see. We panicked, as you might have in this situation. There was an uproar, and then someone shouted that we should go to a nearby house to see if they had a rope or something. It was mayhem in those moments. We were shouting out to the water and shouting at one another. We were just teenagers with no knowledge of how we could help. <sighs> we had no experience. During these moments of chaos, an old man stumbled his way over from a nearby house. What are you doing here? This is off limits, he roared. He made me feel like a little kid. Turns out, he was a fisherman. One of my pals were stripping off to jump into the water to try and help, 
and the old man clamped onto his wrist, then yanked his arm backward. My friend then wrestled to break free from his grasp, shouting all the while completely transfixed. They're drowning! Even the little one! I have to try and save them! The old fisherman commanded him to stop. It was so weird, because about half of the people with us were still asking us about what we were screaming about. The old fisherman's voice cut through the summer night sky. Can't you see? He boomed, and he silenced a lot of us. Of course I could see. The poor people drowning in the water were right before my eyes. He restrained my friend, and at that moment... The tip of his toe reached the wharf's edge, and then he said, Do they look like they are looking for help? It dawned on me that no one had heard any screams for help from the water, just the panic from us at shore. We stood in silence watching the waves, and those that could see them in the water were unable to look away. Look closely, boys. They aren't screaming, are they? They weren't. No, they were smiling. Yeah, sometimes laughing too. See, people like you who go where you shouldn't get drawn in. They're looking for company. They want you there, so we keep it off limits. Boys, I don't want to see you around here again, okay? And all of us left without a word of complaint never to return. Those smiling, drowning faces, that was too much. This was about 28 or 29 years ago, after I graduated from high school and got a job in Saitama. It's a prefecture in Japan which neighbors Tokyo. I got a second-hand car after a couple of months of moving. You really do need one out there. I was glad that I bought one. I used to go on long, relaxing night drives after work and would listen to music and smoke cigarettes. I really enjoyed it. Obviously, that was until the night in question. One night, I was taking a very long drive, way out in the mountains. There wasn't much but darkness and the sound of cicadas all around me. I always drove with the driver's side window down since I was usually smoking. I was driving along this dark road when I heard a scream. It didn't sound like an adult scream. It sounded like a child's scream. It was blood curdling. I don't want to talk about it much because I can still hear it in my mind as I type these words. Trust me, if you heard something like that, you would do what I did. I slammed on the brakes. It was instinctive. I wasn't a believer in the paranormal or anything, and I put a lot of faith into my five senses. I pulled over onto the hard shoulder and got out of my car. I felt chills raise up my spine, and there was no reason why I should have heard what I heard. My car's headlights lit up the dark woods ahead of me, but there was nothing but darkness in all directions. I began to sweat. I was worried, scared, nervous, paranoid, you name it. I was overcome by some terrible dread. What made that sound? Was someone in danger? My legs began to tremble. I thought that was just a thing that people would say, but I found out that it is very true. I couldn't hear anything apart from my own heartbeat and the restless shuffle of my feet on the dirt road beneath them. I was panicked. I managed to convince myself that it was just an auditory hallucination. Maybe I was staying up too late or something. I didn't hear anything else after the initial scream, so I thought I would just get out of there and head home. About three weeks later, I was watching the TV, and the same roads and mountain passes come up on the screen. The newscaster then said something that I will never forget. Satomu Miyazaki has confessed to the murder and has identified the scene of the crime to the authorities. The case had already proceeded to the courts, 
Therefore, I knew that the scream that I heard was not happening in real time. Perhaps it was some distant echo from the past. That scream wasn't one you would hear in an amusement park or if someone startled somebody else. It was an end-of-life scream. It was truly disturbing to imagine what happened there. I didn't have to use my imagination much, since this man's actions were very well documented. If you don't want to sleep tonight, then you can look up the crimes of Satomu Miyazaki, and you'll understand why that scream frightened me so much. What he did truly turns my stomach. After that night, I stopped going for night drives in the woods. Before my final year of college, I decided during that summer break, this being 2003, that I wanted to go on a road trip across the United States. I would use this opportunity to see the various landmarks and even visit some family and friends along the way. For context, this story comes from the perspective of a female who at that time was 22 years old. One day on this road trip, I had woken up super early, about 5 a.m., and by the time it was 8 p.m., I was super exhausted. And fortunately at that point, I was in the middle of nowhere Oklahoma, with the next city not being for at least 50 miles. I was going to just deal with it and drive, but I was struggling to stay awake. No coffee and no sleep does that to you. Well, lucky for me, there was a rest area coming up in a few miles, so why not park there and take a little nap? I'll be up before you know it, I told myself as I made a decision and looked forward to my break. As I reached the exit sign that would lead me to the rest area, I noticed that it's just one small building with really cheap lights. Next to the building off in the field behind it was this medium-sized rock-like formation. It was about one story tall. At the building where the restrooms are, I could also see a couple of vending machines. I made sure to park right next to the restroom entrance and when I stepped out, I swear to you, I almost stepped on a used needle. That was the last thing that I needed happening to me, especially in the middle of nowhere. I now made sure to watch my step, avoiding the trash, and I walked up to the vending machine so I could buy myself a water bottle. At this very moment, I ended up hearing a noise. It sounded like footsteps shuffling and running off, if that makes any sense. I turned my attention behind me, alarmed by this sudden disturbance, and I stared off into the night for a solid 20 seconds. Hello? Is someone there? I called out, but there was no answer. Well, that didn't help, so... I just made the assumption that it was the wind moving the trash that scattered all over the floor. And thus, I returned back to my vehicle, water bottle in hand. Thankfully, I now felt a little more safe, but still very exhausted. I sat there in my seat for about 15 minutes, trying to keep my eyes from shutting and debating if I should just leave. But before I knew it, Darkness hit me, and I had drifted into dreamland. Well, this leap wouldn't last very long, since I was suddenly awoken by something scratching one of my windows. What do you know? One of the scariest sight for me to ever bear witness to. There are three large men surrounding me, one on my driver's side, the passenger side, and I could see one in the back through the rearview mirror. The one on my driver's side door has a large knife, and he's trying to open my door by pulling at the door handle. The one on the passenger side has a handgun, and the one at the back has a baseball bat. Hey, open up, sweetheart. We just want to talk to you. 
I still recall the one with the large knife telling me as he keeps trying to convince me to open the door. As you'd expect, I wasn't just going to sit there and allow these random creeps to try and break in. Any sort of sleepiness I had was instantly zapped away as I turned my car on and started to drive away. However, since they were still pretty close to me, the one with the baseball bat hit the back of my vehicle in retaliation for me almost running him over. I obviously had a loss of words now, but I am somewhat relieved that I had gotten away. However, that relief would only last for 20 or so seconds. Because what do you know? I can see headlights fast approaching me. It wasn't a random stranger's vehicle in the area. No, it was these creeps who now caught up to me. They drove right alongside me and now I can see their vehicle a bit better. It was one of those typical creeper vans you see and hear about in people's scary stories. The one guy on the passenger side window, I remember him pointing his gun at me and signaling for me to pull to the side of the road. Well, what other choices did I have? I could do just that, or drive away and risk getting shot at. I had to make a decision quickly, so what I did was I said I'm going to put pedal to the metal and floor it as fast as I can which in itself was already a super risky move. I pull off a Vin Diesel and I start driving upwards of 90 miles an hour, almost approaching 100 miles, and before I realized it, I had lost those creeps. Thank the Lord. Well, I didn't stop even at this good news, as I continued on until I reached the next town and drove over to the police station to report the incident. They did tell me that they would look into it, and while I did stay in town to get my car fixed, I would return back to the police station to see if there were any updates before I left. They had none, which is such a shame. And I left that town, and from that point on, I choose to spend some extra cash and ensure that I stayed in motels and well-populated places. And by the way, I still believe those creeps who tried to break into my car must have been watching me from the cover of the darkness at that rest area. Remember, I didn't see any vehicles at first, and it wasn't until they got closer to me when making my gateway that I could see the kind of vehicle they drove. I still believe that they must have hidden their vehicle behind that rock formation that I had seen, and I also believe the footsteps I heard weren't the wind like I first assumed. It was one of them trying to sneak up on me. They must have changed their mind at the last minute and then chose to hide. I know this had to have been the wrong place at the wrong time, and they chose to come after me when they noticed that I was asleep. And that in itself is just terrifying. This happened a few years ago, but I still remember it as if it was yesterday, and I will never forget what I saw that night. I was at home doing nothing in particular when my friend called, he said he wanted to get out of his house and ask if I wanted to hang out. I thought, why not? This was at about 3 a.m. I'm not even sure why I was still awake, but I was. He said that he would come and pick me up in his car. We were driving around the city for a while, and my friend suddenly said, Hey, let's go to the wharf. So... That's where we headed. Down by the pier area, by the wharf, there is an old factory. In the daytime, trucks are in and out of there all the time, and it's a pretty busy area. But at night, it was quiet. The roads by the wharf are really wide and straight. On weekend nights, you can sometimes see people racing there. But that night, we were the only ones on the road. 
It made for a quite tense atmosphere. We headed to the wharf like we were being drawn there. We stopped at a traffic light and a car pulled up alongside us. I can't remember the model or the color of the car. I guess it was more like a minivan than a car come to think of it. But either way, it was bigger than a normal car. I am in the passenger seat and my friend is driving. The light changes color and I look at the car and the people in it. I got a really weird vibe from one of the guys in the car, so I just kept watching. I couldn't put my finger on what was weirding me out about these guys at first, but then I noticed one of the guys in the back seat. I could do little else but wonder what was bugging me. Then it dawned on me. The reason I felt something was off about one of the guys was because I couldn't see the bottom half of his face. It was as if it was completely black, like it was missing. Why was it black? I wondered. I thought I was hallucinating or if I was just overtired. Still, I kept on looking at the guy. I was curious. I locked eyes with him and then the car sped away before the lights changed. They ran the red light. In the split second that I saw that guy, his eyes flashed my way, and I had never seen a look of such desperation before or since. His eyes seemed to scream at me. He pressed his face against the window, and then it was like he was pulled backwards before the car sped off. When he was close against the window, I realized that the black thing I saw was tape covering his mouth. It all happened in less than a couple of seconds. The look of fear in his eyes stayed with me. I was deeply concerned. The minivan sped away into the night towards the wharf. I had heard rumors that the Yakuza used to hang out there and are responsible for some of the missing person cases in the area and for some of the bodies that are found washed up in the wharf over the years. Some people say that the wharf is haunted because of this too. It's always been known as a kind of test of courage to head there at night on weekends, but I have never spoken to anyone who went down there on a weekday night. We don't know what goes on there when the town sleeps, but I think I saw a glimpse of it that night. Could this be a prank? I really hope that what I saw was... I guess that's the only outcome I can live with. I didn't get the license plate, and we didn't follow the van. It just happened so quickly. Now I am older. I know that if I saw it again, I would be more proactive. This weighs heavily on me still to this day. I told the police a day or two after it happened, and I never heard back from them. When I think back to that dark summer night and those split seconds that I saw the man with desperation in his eyes and a tape covering his mouth, I can't help but shudder. This happened when I was in university, when I was driving home from a trip. The roads were very dark as I was in the countryside. The mountains and trees were blotting out the moonlight. All of a sudden, my engine began to splutter and slow until it eventually came to a stop. I am not the best with cars, so rather than waste time with guesswork, I figured that I'd call roadside rescue. I had that as part of my insurance. There was nothing much that I could do except wait for someone to arrive. It was creepy out there. The forests are home to strange noises at night. And after a little while, a bright light lit up the road and it was aimed at my car. I thought that the roadside rescue were early. I couldn't believe my luck. But when the light got a little closer, I realized that it wasn't them. It was strange. It didn't look like the light of normal headlights 
and it stopped about 50 meters in front of my car and didn't move. It was getting a bit weird now, unlike standard headlights, which are divided into two light sources, whatever was in front of me had only one source of light. The light was so bright, it didn't seem safe at all. It seemed not to have the same purpose as a light bulb. I didn't like it, and then I saw them, three people approaching from behind the light. These people were very thin and very tall, pushing two meters I'd say, six foot six. And as they moved from behind the light to in front of it, I could see the lines in their faces. Their faces were really gaunt and long. There was something off-putting about these three people that I couldn't quite put my finger on at first. But then I realized what it was. It was their style of clothes and hair and etc. They looked like they were from another time period. It was like they had been wearing the same clothes since the 70s. They were wearing chinos, polo shirts, stuff like that. And they approached my car and one of them spoke to me. Once again, I noticed that there was something slightly off-putting about these people. When they spoke, it had all the wrong intonations. He was emphasizing the wrong syllables, and I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but it wasn't right. It made listening to him difficult, yet I detected no accent to indicate they were foreign. Where did you come from? He asked. I chose to remain silent before answering that. I didn't want to let these strangers know about my car's engine trouble because essentially, I couldn't get away from them. You have trouble with your car, I can fix it, he said. It scared me that he knew that. I said thanks but no thanks and that I had already called roadside rescue. The man was persistent. I kept refusing. I really didn't want to speak to these guys out here in the woods alone. Then, the strangest thing happened. My thoughts felt like they were changing. Like I had to mentally wrestle with myself to not allow them to work on my car. It felt like my mind was being changed for me. I started to wonder if maybe they could help. Maybe it would be a good idea to unlock the door and let them in. I got out of my car, half of my mind screaming at the other half, imploring me to get back into the car and get the doors locked again. But I couldn't fight it. I felt like I should go with these men, go where they wanted me to go. And I started following them towards the light. I was completely transfixed. I didn't need to think for myself. I tried to raise my arm, but I couldn't because I wasn't in control of it. I wanted to be scared, but this calm voice inside my head reassured me that there was nothing to fear. That part of me, that was still me, was screaming at me to do anything to get away from these men. But my internal voice was getting quieter and quieter. While I was walking towards that bright light, my phone started to ring. It must be the roadside rescue people. And it snapped me back to reality, and I was in control again. I was able to answer the phone, and I was back. I knew that I needed that phone to be on. Something about that call saved me. I must have explained my location in about ten different ways to the rescue people. I really wanted to be accurate. I didn't want to be out here anymore. And while I was on my phone, the men were trying to get me to take up their offer for help. I hated the way they towered over me, and their faces were so pale and thin, like barn owls. I refused. I had to. I ran back to my car with a phone clamped to the side of my head, and that was when they began to get angry. They were screaming and shouting by the side of my door. I began to doubt myself. Usually, I would never refuse a kind favor, as I would be willing to do the same for someone in my situation. But given what just happened, I knew that I couldn't trust these men. They were trying to express anger, 
but it was like the concept was entirely new to them. And eventually, they gave up and headed back towards that beam of light. And before leaving, they did this weird thing simultaneously in front of my car. They placed an open palm on their foreheads and then slapped it, as if you're doing a high five to your own head. Their fingers were long and spider-like, and I don't have a clue what that gesture is supposed to mean. The light then shot backwards at tremendous speed, and then it was gone. Shortly after, the roadside rescue team showed up. The guy went to check the engine and couldn't find a single fault with it. He put my keys back in the ignition, turned it, and my engine started without issue. That really freaks me out because I know that the engine stopped. I hated it, but I needed to get out of the woods. I headed into the direction the light shot off, and I managed to get home without further incident. However, when I woke up the next day, I had a really strange rash all over my body. I went to see a dermatologist and she couldn't figure out the cause of the rash. I think the rash went away after 10 days or so with a cream and ointment that I got from the dermatologist. I'm sure that rash was related to the bright light and those three men. Well, I say men, but I'm not entirely convinced of that fact. And about two years after this happened, I was at a party and a woman said that when she was driving in the mountains, in the same area I was, she and her boyfriend said that they saw something similar to what I did. She said on two occasions, she saw beams of light flying across the night sky. Some people snickered at that, but I didn't. It felt all too real. Did we have some sort of encounter with a UFO? It must be really hard to believe this, but I wish I could just... Ah, uh, give you my memories or my mind for a while. The fear those three tall men instilled in me was otherworldly. That said, I don't know why my mind changed to trusting them, like a light being switched on or off. It lingers in my thoughts often, and it was truly disturbing. I, a 22-year-old female, met up with my dad at a tire shop in an increased crime area of town. I'm not really sure why we went to the shop. It was probably around noon and my dad brought his chihuahua with him, so I took her on a walk around the tire shop while he consulted with the mechanics. The shop was about half a football field away from a busy street, with a big field in between the shop and the street in an otherwise residential area. I figured that it was safe enough to walk the dog around in the field because my dad and the mechanics were right there. However, the shop was fenced in and not facing the field, so I guess it wasn't actually that safe for me because my dad or the employees couldn't see me. So I was just walking the little dog around in this field, not too close to the busy street. But then suddenly, this beat-up car with the windows down starts driving really slow on the busy street. I can tell that the dude driving was staring at me. The street is somewhat far away from me, and he eventually drives past, so I'm like, whatever. But then a couple seconds later, I see the car again going down the street in the opposite direction. He's going really fast, and he turns onto the side street where I am. He's driving extremely fast, and he just guns it into the field where I'm walking the dog. Literally jumping the curb, he's coming straight for me. And I'm just shocked, thinking, is he about to plow us down? What the hell is happening? It was just so quick and unexpected, and in my confused shock, I'm just hesitating with the dog contemplating running away, but also not wanting to turn my back on the car. 
Then, miraculously, I guess there was some kind of uneven ground or a hole because the guy's car got stuck and the wheel started spinning. With his windows down, I can hear him cursing and take this moment to scoop up the dog about to run out of there. Then he opens the car door, about to get out of the car, and I can't remember any descriptions about this man other than he was quite overweight. But again, because of the shock, I can't even recall his race, age range, or anything. Right at that moment, a truck pulls up beside us with two youngish men inside. It was like a construction truck. They roll down the windows and ask if the guy is bothering me, and they say it loudly, and it spooks the guy and he goes back into his car. He then is able to peel out in reverse from whatever hole the car was stuck in, and he quickly reverses out from the field we're in, back onto the street, and then takes off. The kind men who stop apparently saw all of this happened, and it just happened so quickly. They were just as confused as I was. What was this dude's game plan? What was he attempting? Kidnapping me in broad daylight? Obviously with people around? I'm not sure. I'm so glad his car got stuck and I didn't find out. It was just very strange. I'm grateful his car got stuck and the guys who drove by stopped and were willing to check out the situation. We chatted for a second after the guy left and we were all very confused about what had happened. I can be overconfident at times about my safety, but after a handful of other strange potentially dangerous encounters, I've learned to always be alert. Bad things can happen anytime and anywhere, and don't freeze in fight or flight situations. So many times, I've frozen instead of fighting or flighting, when I really should have taken some kind of action. Thankfully, my guardian angels have my back, but I won't take them for granted. So this happened on Saturday. I, 29-year-old female, live in a decent neighborhood. It's not the best, but definitely not one usually thought of as super dangerous. It wasn't even that late at that time. It was like 9.30 p.m., and it is summer in my country, so it had been dark for an hour or two at most. I had left my friend taking transport back home. Since my friend had left in a rush, there was a thing I wanted to tell that I felt I would forget once I was home. But I got my phone taken from my hands a few months ago, so I was waiting until I was in a safe place to take it out. So I turn a corner and there's literally one block to my house, and this is a pretty small street. I thought I was safe, but suddenly, someone talks to me. His words were slurred, so I didn't quite get what he said, and it was dark. But after a moment, I understood that he was telling me to give him my phone or my wallet or something. I stared, and despite the darkness, I saw something in his hand which he was holding very much like a gun. I think it may have been fake, but still, I was terrified. And for some reason, I looked around and not so far away, walking towards me, was another woman. I screamed for help and ran away from the man, all the while bracing myself for the pain in case the gun wasn't fake. And then the woman yelled at me to stop running and to get inside of the building closest to us. And we did. There, after having a panic attack, the woman told me that the man had been next to a car that I didn't see because I was so fixated on the possible gun. I doubt the man wanted anything other than my phone, but still, the fact was he had a quick and easy escape and that there is a possibility that I could have lost more than just my cell phone. So to the man... Let's never meet again. And to the woman and her friend, who walked me that block home, and also to the door woman that gave me water when I was panicking, 
I'm sorry I didn't ask for your names or properly thank you, but you guys are my heroes. When I was 10, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. My cousin also came to visit, and we decided that we wanted to go to YMCA for the day. My grandmother dropped us off and said she would come and pick us up in four hours. On that day, the YMCA was empty. There were a couple of adults in the exercise room, but that was it. We went to the basketball court and after two hours of playing tag and then shooting baskets, we were bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming, but this YMCA had a pretty cool pool, so we changed into our bathing suits and then headed in there. The pool was empty except for the lifeguard, and we played a bunch of games and swam laps, but after about an hour, there wasn't much left to do and there was no one except us to hang out with to keep things interesting. So we decided to play a game of seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end and near the clock on the wall so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, we just stuck our heads face down in the water. We did this a couple of times and I was winning. And on our last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I figured that it was my cousin giving up and telling me that I won. But instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in the pool, we figured that we would get out, get dressed, and go back to the basketball court until my grandmother picked us up. We only had an hour left anyways and the water was freezing. And as we got out... The lifeguard stopped us and asked if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course, we were super excited that she allowed us to do that. She walked us to the sauna and then unlocked the door. The door was glass and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside and above the door, there was a clock probably to help make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna, but if you looked out the door, you could clearly see it. She followed us in and went over to the thermometer, encased in plastic, and then unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured that she must have to turn it on each time, so I didn't think anything of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls and we couldn't see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob, but I know she was turning up the heat. Then, she left and shut the door behind her. I thought I saw her lock the door too, but I thought to myself, why would she lock the door when we might want to get out? I checked the clock and we decided that we should get out in 10 or 15 minutes. It was already plenty warm in the sauna, but now the room was blazing. It felt nice because I was cold from the pool. And after about 15 minutes, it was starting to get a little bit too hot, and my cousin agreed that we should leave so we can get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door, but it wasn't budging. I thought maybe it was jammed, so I shook it, but it still wasn't opening and then I let my cousin try. She couldn't open it either. We figured that the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes, so we sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter now too, and I really wanted to leave. I got up and started banging on the door and shaking or twisting the knob, trying to get the lifeguard's attention. My cousin got up and joined me, and we started screaming at the top of our lungs for her to let us out, but she just stared straight ahead. I don't think there's any way that she couldn't have noticed or heard two little girls banging and kicking the door and screaming. Now, we had been in there for about 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna that it hurt to breathe. It felt like my lungs were on fire, my eyes and skin were burning, and we sat back down and put our towels over our heads because they were still a little damp, 
and it made it easier to breathe. I was so worried about my cousin, as she was a couple of years younger than me, and I looked at the clock and saw that we had been in there for 35 minutes. I got up and walked to the door again and saw the lifeguard was still just staring straight ahead. Again, I tried to get her attention by screaming that we needed out and banging on the door as hard as I could. But still, nothing. I was starting to get pretty dizzy, so I went to go sit back down but the wooden seats of the sauna burned my skin. My towel was completely dry, so I put it underneath me to sit on. My hair was also dry, but I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose, and I squinted my eyes so that they didn't burn as bad, but I could still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped a little bit. My cousin was laying face down with a towel over her head, not moving or saying anything, so I nudged her to make sure that she was still okay. She was, but I could tell that we really needed to get out of there soon because she seemed a bit disoriented. It had been 45 minutes now and I was extremely nauseous. There was no way that the lifeguard would forget that we were in there, and I thought that she would have to come back soon, but there was this little voice in my head telling me that maybe she purposely locked us in there. Finally, a man walked past the door towards the pool, but for some reason, I just couldn't get up. My whole body was on fire and I felt dizzy. Luckily, this man wasn't going to the pool. He wanted to be let into the sauna and came back with a lifeguard. I saw them walking this way and immediately jumped to grab my cousin. I knew now that for sure she had locked us in there because she pulled out her keys to unlock the door and let the man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer, so as the man was trying to walk in, I was trying to shove our way out. And as we were going out, the lifeguard started trying to shut the door and push us back with it. The man was clearly confused about what was going on and said, Um, I think they want out. The lifeguard let out a sigh and opened the door fully, and we ran away as fast as we could into the changing room. We only had about ten minutes before a grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner, and I told them the story of what just happened, and they thought that I must have been exaggerating and they didn't believe me. I truly think that that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt that I had is what would have happened if we actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. What was her endgame? I'm 21 now, but I think about this interaction all the time, and when I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one believes this story, and I get it. It's pretty absurd. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions, but do you think that this could have been some crazy misunderstanding, or do you think that she really just left us in there to die? And why? So... To the lifeguard at the YMCA, please, let's not meet again. I don't live in the best area, but it's close to my kid's school and it's what we can afford. I was in line at a stoplight waiting for it to change so I could get to the school to pick up my older kids. I had my toddler with me. And while I was sitting, I heard my passenger side handle move, like someone was trying to open it. I always lock my car doors out of habit. And my car is older, so they don't lock automatically when I start the car like newer ones do. I look over, and there is an older woman aggressively trying to open my door. My window is cracked a bit for fresh air, but not all the way down. She reached up trying to get the window to go down, but couldn't get her fingers in. The woman said, Excuse me, I need you to help me out. I need a ride. Now, 
I'm all for helping people, but not when they are trying to get in my car with no explanation. You just don't do that. So I said, Do you need me to call 911? And the woman answered, No, you need to help me. Let me in. Come on now, help me out. And she pulls on the door again. Luckily for me, the light changed and I told her, Sorry, but I have to go. I can't help you. And I drove off, and I haven't seen her since. It's the only way to get to my kid's school, so I have to drive through that way about every day. Lady, let's not meet. I used to work on board a ship. And I remember that when I joined the company, the ship that I was going to be boarding entered the shipyard for a routine inspection. I was able to see some of the places and aspects of the ship that I wouldn't usually see if it was at sea. It was really interesting. The ship in question was massive. It was a super large oil tanker, which was 300 meters in length. It's hard to fathom that something so big can exist, but don't worry, the ocean makes it look tiny, and I don't know if that thought is comforting or not. We were checking the internal pipeline of the ship. When it comes to a ship of this size, from the deck to the bilger bottom of the ship, it spans for about 30 meters. Absolutely massive. The pipeline in question ran along the bottom of the ship. The pipe wasn't all that thick. It was about 80 centimeters in diameter, and I can't remember how long it was, but I think it was 150 meters, and it was in a straight line. It might have been longer, actually. It was pretty incredible. But then next came the daunting part, inspecting the pipe. I tried to console myself with the idea that it was just a straight line pipe, and there were no corners or bends. I was nervous enough, and I don't think that I was ready for navigating bends. It was pitch black in there, and I was feeling claustrophobic. I don't know if it was some sort of test of my mental strength, but as I was a couple of meters into the tunnel, my boss called and said, If you get stuck in there, there's no way I can get you out, so be careful, alright? Thankfully, he was ahead of me in the pipeline. I guess that if there was any trouble, then he would tell me to turn back. We had elbow and knee pads on, and I don't think that I could have done it without them. We had flashlights too, but none of these things made crawling through a deep dark pipe on all fours any easier. It was my first time doing this, and it was really hard to keep pace with my boss. Also, it was an incredibly hot day in some port of Singapore. Human? Yeah, you bet. My mentality in that scenario was pretty much, get in and get out. I wanted it to be all over as soon as possible. I was new and incensed and underling, and I felt like it wasn't my responsibility. I was looking for the quickest route out of the pipes. And like I said... The pipeline we entered was 80 centimeters in diameter. It was tight, and the boss said that he had been in a pipe with a diameter of 60 centimeters. And on top of that, the pipe had twists and turns, and it went for 200 meters. And that just sounds absolutely crazy to me. The oil tanks I mentioned earlier are separated all over the ship. I think that there was about 10 in total, Except for a couple of small ones in the area, the tanks are like the size of football fields and they are about 30 meters high. There is only one entrance or exit to these tanks and you have to open a meter wide hatch and climb down a ladder. And it's kind of like a manhole I guess. The light comes in from above when you are in those tanks and it creates a very dim and dark atmosphere. It's truly unique. So, if you close all the manholes I mentioned without checking properly, then naturally, 
you will trap someone down there if they are on an inspection duty. In fact, there are countless blind spots and places to hide on the ship if you look from the deck. Even static electricity can ignite the oil in these tankers and can cause a massive explosion. So therefore, once these tankers are sealed, no oxygen can get in them as to not create conditions where explosions could be possible. In other words, if you get trapped in one of these things with a manhole-like cover sealed, you'll die of suffocation slowly in the dark. Actually, I've heard stories of these type of deaths occurring. People in my line of work have discovered bodies in the tanks. The bodies have said to be found near the ladder at the bottom of the hatch, and some say that they have seen scratch marks on the inside of the hatch. They say that the bodies have missing fingernails, and sometimes you can see bones of their fingers. They scratch them to the bone, desperately trying to escape the coffin-like tanker. I thought that these stories were nothing but rumors, but here in Singapore, I have known many ships that leave with a certain number of staff on board, and when they return, the number of staff is reduced. I thought it was just someone trying to scare me, but believe me, I have seen the vacancies get posted, and I have seen the searches all over the ship for the missing staff members, and it's proof enough for me. I have heard that this dangerous inspection work has been outsourced to Southeast Asia to save on cost. These cheaper companies have been said to be less safety conscious during inspections and less interested in devoting man hours in the search of missing crewmates. Anyways, when I have been down in the tankers and crawling along those pipes on board, I felt something. I felt something close to loneliness, but much more profound. I felt desperation and horror and all the rumors felt like they could have been the truth. A few years back, my now husband and I were living with my mom. My husband had started a new job or he was working 14-hour shifts and wouldn't get home until 11 p.m. My brother liked to go out, so he also wasn't home. This meant that my mom and I were home alone on Halloween. We lived on a busy street, so we ran out of candy at around 9 p.m. My mom put a sign on the door, and then we went to bed. For some background, we had five dogs in the house, and at this point, my brother was about 21 years old and I was 22. My brother has a female German Shepherd slash Husky mix named Coco and she is very good at reading our body language. Our screen door had a large window and didn't lock and our main door didn't have a view window. So the doorbell rings around 11.30 p.m and I got up instantly and ran to the door. I stupidly assumed, without a thought or two, that it was my husband coming home from work. I opened the door without thinking, and there were two very large people wearing black hoodies and black sweats. I knew the screen door didn't lock, so I realized that this was a bad situation. My mom had heard the doorbell as well, so she was also walking to the door. My husband had the keys to the house, so my mom having good instincts realized that it wasn't him and decided to come with me to the door. I was stunned and I didn't say anything, but my mom comes from behind me and aggressively says, Can I help you? And before they can even speak, Coco jumped up at the glass and started barking and growling at them. When her paws pushed on the door, it opened slightly and the two people took a step back. They both just said, Trick or treat. And my mom said, Don't you see the sign? We're out of candy. Then the two people walked away. My husband came home 15 minutes later 
and we told him what had happened. Coco for sure saved us from a bad situation. She never acts that aggressively when people come to the door. The next morning, we saw on the news a few blocks away that two people that matched the description of the two people that came to our door were shot and killed because they tried to rob the home of an off-duty police officer. And the time of the incident was 30 minutes after the two people came to our door. This actually happened to me a few years ago. I started working at a local gas station part-time after high school. I figured if I'm staying home, might as well do something productive and make my own money too. Most shifts were at night, so they were either dead or full of drunks, but I usually work with one other person, so it wasn't too bad, especially when we had people get out of hand. I actually like it for the most part. And on the slow nights, I let the neat freak in me come out and I start organizing the shelves better so that everything is lined up right and not scattered around and piled up. There was one guy, let's call him Mark, that usually worked the nights with me and he'd play music on his phone so it wasn't completely silent which was nice. One downfall, though, was that I didn't have a car anymore, as mine finally died on me. So, I had to rely on rides from my parents, friends, or sometimes an Uber to get to places. But still, it was manageable, because I only lived a few miles away from my home, so I could even walk there. I believe it was in late September when this happened, because it wasn't too hot, but it started getting cooler overnight. I had decided to walk to work since it was nice out and my parents weren't home to take me anyways. It was just a normal shift, except it was also football season, so we were a bit busier before games started and dead while it was on. And then we would get a quick burst of people at the end. And as I'm ringing people up, I looked up to see my line and I notice a guy in basketball shorts, socks with sandals on, and a shirt that said something about a gun show. I roll, am I right? He was looking right at me and smiling, so I just smiled back and continued working on the line. After a few, I looked back and noticed that the line wasn't going down, so I called for Mark to come up and help. A sandal guy was up next. I noticed that he had one of those tall cans of tea and nothing else, and he was still smiling so I just said, Sorry you had to wait just for this. And without taking his eyes off of me, he said, Oh, it's alright, sweetie, as long as I get to see your beautiful smile. I haven't really dated much, nor have I had much experience in flirting, so I didn't really know how to react to this. Not to mention, he had to be close to my parents' age, so I just made some weird chuckle sound and I didn't say another word. He paid with a card and I handed him his receipt without saying another word to him. And he just said, Good night, sweetie. And then walked out. I didn't have time to process what just happened as I had a few more people in line, so I just continued until we cleared out again. And when I was done, I was about to ask Mark to help me with something when he said, Oh, sure, sweetie. He was a nice guy, and we never had problems with each other, so I knew he was teasing, but it snapped me back to when I started laughing and asked, so, you saw that too? Was that not weird? He said he thought the dude was weird, but the flustered side of me was adorable. Funny to him, but I didn't know what to say, and the guy was just... off, so none of that was enjoyable. Our night went back to normal for a while. He was in the back again, 
as he did some of the bookwork while I was messing with the shelves. We were kind of shouting back and forth about something that we were both really involved in when someone came in. I started walking back around the counter when I noticed that it was the sandal guy again. He noticed me and he waved. So I waved back and he started walking towards the coolers in the back. I quickly made a comment to Mark about him being there and just waited for the dreadful checkout. He walked up to the counter and said, I forgot to get gas. If that was the case, why did he walk to the back? I just smiled and rang him up, and as I handed him his receipt, he made sure to reach further in to touch my hand and said, I'm glad I decided to stop here tonight and smiled as he shook my hand. My hand was limp because I was not interested in this. I mean, at all. At this point, Mark had walked out from the back and said, Hey, Kate, my part's done. I'll take over. Thank God. I pulled my arm back real quick and dashed to the back and waited. I didn't hear another word from the guy, but I heard the bell on the door and Mark walked to the back. He said when I turned around, the guy cocked his head like he was trying to look at my ass when he walked in front of his view. He said when he noticed this, he grabbed his candy and dashed out the door. I mean, who does this right in front of people? Anyways, the rest of the night was okay again. Had some lady come in singing and got Mark to sing, so that was funny. And we were having a good time. It was getting close to closing, so Mark had taken the trash out back so he could smoke and I was up front again, reading a magazine. And to my surprise, Sandal Guy walks in, again. It had to show on my face that I was not okay with this. But he again immediately smiled and was looking around, like he was trying to find something. And that's when he grabbed another candy bar and said, For you, Catherine Lee, I can't stay away. Can I give you a ride home so we can talk? I was shocked. My name badge says Kate. I don't go by Catherine or my middle name, so how would he have known that? I didn't know how to reply, so I just said that no thanks that I have a ride. To which he said, But you walked here, right? How would he have known that? I just told him that I had a ride and he wouldn't stop. Saying that he wanted to get to know me more and take care of me. And I remind you, I was around 19 years old and this guy could have been my father. I tried cutting him off to ask him if he was going to purchase anything when he tried to reach for my hand again and I pulled back. At this point, Mark walked back in right as he started pleading. Mark immediately walked over to the guy telling him that he needed to leave. He started shouting as he was being pushed out that he'll wait for me. And Mark locked the door and made sure that I was okay. But I was just more shaken up than anything. He had me doing some other things from there, like more organizing, stocking anything that was empty, and mopping while he watched the door. He wouldn't lock the door to let people in then lock it again. And at closing, he was finishing the last things, so I had pulled out my phone and opened Facebook. When I noticed that I had a friend request, it was the sandal sky. That's when I figured out where he knew my name from and also realized that my address was on there. I told Mark about this and he suggested that he take me home. I did not refuse either. And as we left, I was looking around to see if he was waiting, but I never saw anyone. As he was driving, he tried to loosen up the tension and joke with me, but I think we were both worried about it still. And once we got to my place, the lights were on, so I knew my parents were still up, thankfully, and I noticed Mark was still out there when I had gone in, and then I made sure to lock the door. 
I thought it was just to make sure that I got in okay. And after I was in, I changed clothes and went to get something to eat when there was a knock on the door. It was the cops. They were explaining that there was a report of a suspicious person and gave a description of the vehicle and the person. You know it. It was the same guy. So I had to explain to the cops and my parents what happened. The cops said that they would drive around a few times to make sure that he didn't come back. And thankfully he didn't. But they did tell us that if he came back, just to call them again. Unfortunately, there was little they could do since he hadn't actually done anything. The next time I worked though, Mark explained what had happened. He said that he noticed a car following us, but didn't want to say anything and scare me. And after I got inside, he saw the truck turn to the corner onto my road, so he got out of his car and noticed that it was the same guy as he was driving by. He said that he thinks he recognized him too as he started to speed up. So, he called the cops to report it for us. I was incredibly thankful for what he did too. Thankfully, we never saw the guy again, so hopefully he got the hint. But you can bet that I did a clean up on my Facebook too. I've been working as a gas station attendant for quite a while now, somewhere close to 10 years, mostly because I have a record and I have had some demons in my past that made me struggle with living a normal life. That said, I'm clean and healthy again, but working at my local station has been almost therapeutic. It's not a terribly difficult job, it's not overly demanding, and the pay is enough for what I need, and I get to talk to various people that I both want and don't want to know. That, and I just get to do my job and not be bothered with too much. And it's tough to get fired. The more I talk about it, the more I realize that I really do like this job, which may sound weird, but eh, <laughs> I'm kind of weird. Anyways, all that aside, I've been doing this for a long time and like I said, I haven't had too much happen that's been too terribly crazy. We've been robbed once when I wasn't working and the police were there within literal seconds. The guy got shot but survived and after that, we were pretty much never hit again. We actually still have a bullet hole in the back wall from where one of the officer's rounds hit. It's a good conversation piece for the newbies, at the very least. It's a good way to say to them, Look, this isn't the safest job in the world and stuff happens, but you're more likely to get attacked walking out in the streets than you are behind the thick plastic that we have between ourselves and the customer. So all that aside, let's get into the one major event that made me dislike this job just a little bit. It's less of a scary story and more like an unsettling situation or event to be put in. Plus, it kind of messed with my head to be honest. It all started on a Thursday night, which is not a busy night for our station. We usually get around 70% of our foot traffic Friday through Sunday. So, I was pretty tired and bored with the night. Anyways, we get a customer that walks in the door, and I immediately knew that it was going to be a problem. This guy looked incredibly familiar to me, and I could tell by the look in his eyes that he recognized me. For most people, that wouldn't be an issue. For me, that meant that he was probably a druggie and that I most likely knew him from back when I was a user. Based on his appearance, which I know I really shouldn't do, he was a user. When you work in retail and when you know those kinds of people, you tend to watch them to make sure they aren't shoving things in their pockets. 
I was watching this guy like a hawk, keeping my eyes on him and on the camera screens. And to my surprise, he didn't do anything bad. He didn't take anything. He just grabbed some chips, candy, and a Red Bull, and a few other things. Then, he walked up to the counter and gave me a mostly toothless smile. Being as polite as I could, I asked how he was that evening, just trying to make small talk and keep it shallow. He tells me he was doing alright. I start scanning his items and then turn to tell him his total, and he smacks the counter with his hands, making me jump. As soon as he does, he shouts, Wait a minute. Danielle, I knew I recognized you. Danny, how you've been, man? Which, again, was something I was hoping wouldn't happen. I've been clean for a long time, and I've avoided these kinds of people for years, and I've been trying to keep myself on the straight and narrow. I told him that I was doing good, and that I was just chugging along, keeping clean and working hard. He laughed and told me that he was trying to stay off the junk, and that it was hard. I agreed and I told him that it takes time and a lot of willpower, but it's definitely worth it. I told him that ever since I stopped using, life became more clear and I realized what damage I was doing to myself. I knew it was probably preachy, but I was hopeful that I could get him to see that being clean was important. After a bit more of me trying to convince him that being clean was worth it, and even mentioning that I could give him the name of a great rehab center in the area. He'll literally ask me if I know where he can score some heroin. I literally just paused and stared at him, my jaw clenched and my eyes half closed. He realized that he had just asked someone that had been clean for years where to get drugs. I know he realized because he said he was sorry and out of line, which should have been enough, but honestly, he hit a nerve. I didn't say much more. I finished bagging his stuff and told him to have a good night in a matter that could be seen as cold. I felt bad, but at the same time, you don't ask a former addict, one that worked hard to get clean, if they can help you score a hit. You just don't do it. And after he left, I kind of just forgot about him, and I moved on with my night. We had a few more customers, but overall, the night was pretty standard. I rang up everyone, stocked the shelves when I could, and pretty much just killed the hours doing some cleaning. About four or five hours later, my second person came in for the end of my shift, so I could go ahead and start doing the outdoor cleaning trash, pumps, and also cleaning up the lot. Anyways, Jay gets in, he clocks in, and I run the count on the register. I put it in the book in the back, and I inform him that I'm going to take out the trash, so he takes over the register. I get all the bags ready, and I head out the back toward where the dumpster is. I throw the first bag in, and the sound seems off. It sounded like there was something in the dumpster. It may sound really dumb, but after doing this for damn near a decade, there are patterns and things like that that sort of click in your head. They empty the dumpsters midday around here on Thursdays, so it should have been empty, and the trash usually makes a decent thump in the empty dumpster. But this time, it didn't. It sounded like it hit something soft at the bottom. My first thought was that maybe they didn't pick up the trash earlier, which would have been an issue as the owner pays for that service. I sighed and put my foot up on the rung to look in the dumpster. And I see him. The guy that came into the store a few hours prior. The guy that asked me where he could get some heroin. He was lying on the bottom of the dumpster and was clearly blitzed out of his mind. He even still had a cloth on his arm. I was livid. 
this guy had seriously jumped in our dumpster to shoot up. He seriously had the audacity to do this after everything I had said to him. I threw the second bag off to the side and went back into the store, then told Jay to call the cops. I told him that some junkie had shot up in the dumpster and passed out and that we needed the cops and probably a medic. He called 911 and I told him to wait out front for the cops and that I would take over the store until then. He did as I asked and called the boss to let them know what was going on and he said he would be there in about 30 minutes. This whole time, I'm just fuming at the fact that I told this guy that I knew from back when I was hooked on drugs all about how I got clean, how life was worth it, and how he should look into getting help, and even gave him the name of the facility that I went through. Then, he felt like it was okay to get trashed in our trash. My anger was, well, the best way to put it, short-lived when the paramedic showed up. I expected them to just pull him out, wheel him up on a stretcher, and then get him to ER. But then I noticed that, with a stretcher, they pulled out one of those plastic body bags. My rage immediately shifted to a deep sense of pity. Jay came back in with the boss and one of the officers, and they asked some questions, obviously. I told them that he came earlier and bought some stuff and that we chatted. I told them that I actually recognized him from back when I was an addict, but that I was clean and I hadn't seen him for at least 10 years. They then informed me that they found the candy and a half-empty chip bag on his person along with a card that I had written the number for the rehab facility on. And they also informed me that he had, pretty much for certain, died from an overdose. That he probably just overdid it and passed out, but then he didn't wake up. Honestly, this was a terrible situation, and while I was upset that he went and did that, I was just as depressed over the fact that I was probably the last person this guy talked to. I know that there was nothing more that I could do, and I feel like, had this guy woken up in the morning and saw the card with the number when he was sober, he might have gone and gotten help. Of course, we'll never know, and it really does haunt me that, had I not gotten clean when I did, that could have been me in that situation. I do feel bad that he passed away, but the users all know the risk when they push that needle in. I really do hope he found peace on the other side. Back in the early 2000s, I worked in a gas station or rest stop that was off of a highway. It was one of those stops that it was in the middle of nowhere that you see as the single stop for the next 100 miles. So, it was quite the drive getting there and going home, but it was also quiet, for the most part. You can get some weirdos crossing the state line, but it's always nice knowing that you probably won't see the same person again outside truckers maybe. Sometimes... My husband would come in on his days off and just sit up on one of the booths, reading or something, while I worked there. I remember this event happening in the summer because it was so hot, so I had the fans on near the front just to keep cool since I would be close to the doors. My husband wasn't feeling well, so he had stayed home, but there were two other people working. An older woman, Rosa, who worked in the kitchen area, where we make the hot foods, and the other cashier, Evan. Rosa had left as we had closed the food station at 9, so it was just going to be the two of us. Again, with our location and it being as late as it was, we didn't get a lot of customers. More so, it would be people coming in to buy a phone charger, use the restroom, and sleep in the parking lot. 
so it wasn't uncommon to see cars parked, but we still kept an eye on them for our safety. On this night, Evan had just walked away to get something to eat and also take a short break. I was up front, sitting behind the register reading, when a few people had walked in. By this time, it was around 11, so the first couple to walk in look exhausted. They were looking at energy drinks and donuts, and all I could do was chuckle to myself, knowing that they were going to crash soon. And while they were looking around, I saw another person walk in. Because the door makes a sound when it's open, so I looked over immediately to see them, and she turned her face away quickly as she started fidgeting with her hair. It was a woman who appeared to be by herself, but she stood out to me because she was wearing a hoodie and sweatpants. Like I mentioned, it was summer and it was hot. The state I'm in is known for being hot and miserably humid, so I thought it was odd, especially because she didn't look cold. In fact, it looked like she was sweating, so maybe she was ill. She looked like she hadn't brushed her hair either, but she was trying to run her fingers through it and pull around her face. Again, we can get some oddballs, so I didn't think anything else of it, other than to just watch to make sure she didn't steal anything. After walking around a few aisles, she came up, and while trying to avoid eye contact, she asked where the restrooms were. I noticed when she approached that she really didn't look well. Her face was pale, lips dry and cracked, and she was, in fact, sweating. I asked her if she was okay and she smiled slightly, saying that she was just carsick. I let it go, as it was none of my business, as long as she wasn't in danger or anything, and I pointed her to the restrooms. So the restrooms are on the little diner or food side, so she had to walk towards the other side to get there. We had one of those corner mirrors hanging, so we could see people coming and going from that direction though. And I watched her walk over there and head down that hall with no issues. A couple minutes later, the first couple walked up with like six different energy drinks, donuts, and two bottles of water. And I remember this because I teased them about the water to caffeine ratio and I convinced them to buy more water. I speak from experience after all, and we joked and talked for a bit about where they were from and headed to, and they mentioned how they grossly underestimated how much they would spend on gas. They gave me a 10 to put towards their gas and then left. Shortly after, Evan came back up from break and we started talking about the couple that came in, when the phone rang. There was a phone up front that was usually only used by us employees to call in, or when they needed to make a call. Management, when they would ask or remind us to do something, and of course, for emergencies. It was the manager calling, asking us how it was going, and to check if Rosa turned off all the fryers and oven, as she had forgotten a few times. I remember this because the kitchen is creepy when it's closed because it gets really dark and all you can hear is the AC or heater blowers or faint talking from the front. So what else does a lady do but ask the guy to go do it? So I stayed there and started reading again when Evan came back up in one piece, thankfully and he turned on the small TV that we had up there. It had been a few hours of us sitting, walking around, getting a customer here and there, when we had one lady walk in and again ask for the restrooms. As she started walking in the back, I remember the lady in the hoodie, because I never saw her leave. I started asking Evan if he had seen her when the woman had come running back to the front, saying that there was a baby in the restroom. I remember, I just paused for a second, 
to register what she said when she clarified. There's a newborn in there, like alone. And I immediately rushed to the restrooms. And in the stall was a newborn in the toilet. It looked like someone tried to cover the poor thing with toilet paper and then the seat covers. I have a daughter. She's a teen now, but I remember when she was born and it being the best feeling in my world. So this made my heart stop. I immediately grabbed the baby and noticed that she wasn't breathing. She was cold and almost a purple color. And I took her to the sink and tried my best to run some warm water on her to clean her up and did my best with CPR. I was so worried that I was going to hurt her or that I was too late. But she finally started crying. I was relieved, but still in shock as I held this baby with no sign of her mother. I picked her up and immediately ran to the front asking Evan to grab towels from the kitchen as I grabbed the phone to call 911. When Evan came back, he looked just as confused as I did at first. I wrapped the baby up the best that I could and got her to stop crying. The woman that found her said that she just opened the stall and saw her in there, but there was no one else in sight. She was the only person that had asked for their restrooms since the woman in the hoodie. That's when it dawned on me that she probably looked the way she did because she was going into labor. But if so, she left without me even seeing her. How long was she in there? We didn't even hear someone, and believe me, labor is not a silent thing. With our location, the ambulance didn't arrive fast, but it also felt like an eternity holding this baby. I was just trying to comfort her, knowing that one of the first faces she's seen, she may never see again. With the ambulance and police there, they took our statements and that's when I really started feeling awful. We didn't even see the car she was in. We didn't know where she was coming from or where she was going. She could have been in a completely different state by this time. But we did have cameras set up, so we had to give that to the police. But unfortunately, the one inside was the only one that recorded and the one in the parking lot was live and didn't save, so we didn't have car information. Before they left, the paramedic did tell me that the baby seemed fine and that I most likely saved her life. I don't know if they ever found the mom, but I hope the girl is doing okay. After that, I took a CPR class and paid more attention to my customers and their comings and goings. And here are the top comments for my last video. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember... Your fear feeds me.